evening, popular astronomers. It is Vicky with Pop Astro Live, and I'm very pleased to announce that myself and Cosmo the Telescope Sloth are both wearing matching bling from the SPA Christmas shopping catalog, which is available now at popastro.com. For all of your fantastic blinging merchandise astronomer gift requirements. How are you, popular astronomers? We're out of lockdown here in Wales, but uh, commiserations to you if you're in England and other <laughs> law-abiding countries. Um, it's not really got much, di it's not really much different actually. Where I think I've become so institutionalized with not going out that um, I'm quite content to stay in now. Hello, Cosmo. Hi, Paulina. Do you like my new gold captions? Oh, the I definitely have to put the next one on. Thank you, Paulina. Good evening, gorgeous Vicky. Happy Friday. It's the only day of the week where it's actually worth me doing my hair and putting on some makeup. This is my big night out. So this is Pop Astro Live. If you are joining us for the first time, this is one hour of um, cavorting around the universe, I think we shall say. We've been doing this maybe now for four or five months and the guests just keep on getting better and better. Thank you very much. Hello to everybody in the chat room. Now, this is on behalf of the Society for Popular Astronomy. We have got all sorts of wonderful things that you get if you join like this magazine every two months. Loads of other cool stuff as well. And um, basically, we are a society. Uh, we're not a commercial operation, so we need as many members as we can. So please share this video and do consider joining if you are not a member. But most importantly, you can join in with the chat in the chat room and make new astronomy friends. I've got low Camera goes the wrong way. I've got... No, hang on. I'm trying to point at the chat room, but I guess it's going to be in a different place for everybody's computer. It looked like I was trying to do some really terrible dance then. So make new friends. I am friends with about maybe five or six new people here in the chat room that I know once the restrictions lift, the minute we all get back to an SPA meeting, I am going to have new friends that I've met through this chat room. And that for me is really exciting because I am such a social butterfly. I really am. What's that? Oh, thought someone said my sound was off then hi vicky again and everyone from lockdown west of scotland yeah speaking of butterflies you know i'm in the laundrette here you're probably not gonna be able to see it can you see it can you see that little black thing on the um where my finger's wiggling that is a hibernating or is it in torpor it might be in torpor mammals go in torpor i'm not sure it's a it's a a, a minute not a miniature it's a small tortoise shell butterfly there i have poked it a couple of times and it definitely doesn't move so hello everybody here we are again the familiar faces of the cat face lady in the chat room um thank you very much everybody so let's run down the guests that we have got this evening for you just for you okay well first of all what have you seen this in the sky this week as you might already know, I live very far out on Anglesey, really far out into the Irish Sea, and we get the brunt of the incoming westerly weather, and we've just had weather front after weather front. So my telescope has basically gone into early retirement. It got covered in fairy lights today. We've decorated it because the chance of clear skies for the next couple of weeks isn't looking too good. And in fact, I did just see the long-range weather forecast. It looks like we're going to be having, have yourself a mushy little Christmas that's unusually mild by the look of it. So I've not seen anything in the sky other than the undersides of rain clouds, which have been clinging to the island like a dirty dish rag. We have excellent horizons here. So that's what I've seen. Cloud formations, very dark gray, and it started to get dark at about two o'clock, it seems. Um, so please also start asking questions in the chat room. If you're brand new to the world of astronomy and you feel intimidated, please do not. Um, because even what you think might be the most obvious questions can spark absolutely fantastic debate. So please feel free. We have got astronomers on standby to start answering your questions. So guests this evening, we've got Neil Deacon, author of 20 Worlds, the extraordinary story of planets around other stars. So if you're into your exoplanets, this interview coming up in a couple of 
of moments is going to be just your thing. We've got Owen Gwynn, chair of Mid Cheshire Astro, my society. I've not seen them for so many months. I've not had Liz's cakes for so long. Liz, I miss your star cakes. And we've also got Luke Tyus of Durham University. He's an instrument scientist who gets to drive some of the world's largest telescopes. What is this? This is a mystery object which we will be showing later. And it relates to that. But bad news and bad luck. Awful, awful. I feel like I have a piece of my heart torn out when I saw the pictures of the hallowed Arecibo dish with the big hole ripped through it. It's kind of like a wire mesh and it is just peppered with holes now. It's absolutely awful. So the observatory has played a key part in space exploration. This might be news to you. I would Google right now a Arecibo dish and have a look at the state of it, that beautiful fragile dish. But two accidents have rendered the 305 meter wide instrument unsafe. Um, it is nestled deep in the Puerto Rican jungle and it's going to be shut down, ending 57 years of astronomical discoveries. Uh, a cable slipped loose from its socket, falling and gashing a 30 metre hole in the reflector dish. Another cable then broke earlier this month, tearing a new hole in the dish and damaging nearby cables as engineers scrambled to devise a plan to preserve the crippled structure. The accidents at the site, also famed as the settings for James Bond's Golden Eye. Golden Eye, I think that was the one with, was that the one with Pierce Brosnan? It's one of the only James Bond films that I really got into. Was it Golden Eye? Thunderface. Yeah, Golden Eye. I'm sure that was the, the, the Pierce Brosnan one. Someone correct me. I'm fairly sure did have a bit of a crush on Pierce Brosnan back in the day because of those films. Um, and also Contact starring Jodie Foster. So the accidents prompted the US National Science Foundation, an independent government agency, to call time on the facility. So I um, am feeling bad about Arecibo and I know that the SPA has friends in high places. Didn't Tim O'Brien of Jodrell Bank used to be our president, Mr. President, I'm sure? I'm sure he did. And um, I wonder how we could start it's not really going to be a campaign, but a lobby or very, very small petition with a few numbers, but a powerful petition nonetheless to get all of the radio telescopes in the world, because they're all obviously controllable, to just bow their heads and go, well, I mean, they're pretty silent anyway, but stop receiving for Arecibo for two minutes. And they can all point at Arecibo. I think that'd be a really nice gesture. Could catch the attention of the public. How do we lead that campaign? Right, okay, uh, we, oh, most importantly this evening though, it's the return of Crater or Potato. I've been waiting for months to find a way to lever everybody's tuba-based quiz back into uh, proceedings. So for each of the three guests that we have tonight, we're gonna be asking them, is it a crater? Is it a potato? I mean, there's three trillion craters on the moon or something like that, and 4,000 varieties of potato. So it's a tough quiz. Make no bones about it. Uh, right, we're going to go over to our first guest now, Author Neil Deacon. He is coming in. Three, two, one. Hello. Hello. Hey, Neil, how are you? Hiya. Not too bad. Yourself? I'm really good, thank you. This is my favourite night of the week and I'm just looking at myself for the first time in my jumper blending in with my backdrop, so that's good. Okay, cool, cool. Whereabouts are you this evening then? I'm in Heidelberg in Germany. Oh right, okay, that is exciting. What are you doing there? Uh, I live here, uh, I work at the uh, up the hill, uh, well, I would normally work in a big building shaped like a galaxy, but obviously we're not in there at the moment. Um, What's this thing called, please? It's called the House de Astronomy. It's uh, a very kind of modern art, uh, modern art building, modern architecture building, where the the middle is a planetarium, like a galactic bulge, and then there's two spiral arms that kind of come out either side. I'm going to have to Google this. What's it called again? Sorry. House de Astronomy. H A U S. Yeah. D E R, and then it's astronomy with an I E at the end. I have got it. Ah, oh, oh my gosh, I need to work in this building. I need to see this thing. That is fantastic. And it's got like a green a green roof on it as well. Yeah, 
there's also a kind of similar one that European Southern Observatory have built just outside Munich, where it's um, called ESO Supernova, and it's meant to be like a white dwarf and a red dwarf together, with one one kind of drawing matter off the other. That's another kind of odd kind of astronomy shaped building in Germany. Do we have any astronomy shaped buildings in the UK? I need to visit one pronto. I don't know off the top of my head, to be honest. Well, it's, it's the sort of thing that private foundations, when they want to fund some astronomy thing, they want a nice building, so they build one that looks astronomy like. That must be so exciting working there, and I can't believe I've never seen it before. House der Astronomy, it's stunning. Is it cool inside as well? It's cool inside, although it's it's a bit of a pain to kind of walk around in spirals to get to everywhere. The <laughs> Luck luckily, the top floor is mostly um, it's mostly an astronomy magazine's office, uh, Stern and Weltraum, and I don't tend to go there, so I only have to go up one spiral. Um, well, I mean, from the girl who constantly always has to be wearing something cosmic, that's my Annalema necklace, <laughs> uh, and my glittery top, that just looks like somewhere I, where I need to make a pilgrimage to, because I just, that is, I'm blown away by that, I can't believe I've never seen it. So congratulations, so what, what's your job there then, what do you do? Um, so I work, uh, we've just started hosting, it's the I, uh, IU, the International Astronomy Union, Union uh, Office of Astronomy for Education. Uh -huh. So the IU has a couple of different offices, sorry, I should show off my, ex my Planety t-shirt. Oh, um, that's better than mine, better than mine. <laughs> anyway, funny. sorry. We, um, the IU has a number of offices in different parts of the world that kind of focus on different aspects of astronomy. So in Tokyo, there's an office for outreach, in uh, Cape Town, there's an Office of Astronomy for Development, so using astronomy for uh, development projects. Uh, and there's also an Office for Young Astronomers in Oslo. And we're just, we've just been set up, and our job is to kind of coordinate um, astronomy education around the world, doing things like building networks of contacts in different countries to translate things into different languages, um, doing reviews on how to do astronomy education, what the most effective ways are, things like that. That is pretty smart. So you're wearing an exoplanet T-shirt. I take it you mm -hmm. like exoplanets, Neil? Yes, yes. Uh, although my, my research background is a bit more in brown dwarfs than it is in exoplanets. Tell us your favourite brown dwarf fact or notion about them. My favourite one, it's it's a little bit, well, it's, it's moderately theoretical, but you have... These are very hot objects, even though they're much colder than stars. Yeah. And you get clouds forming in their atmosphere, and you get things like clouds of kind of iron vapor, and then rains molten iron, and so you know when those condense. But there's also um, clouds formed of a vaporized mineral called I think it's corundrum, which is the stuff that makes rubies and sapphires. Okay. So you've essentially got when that rains out. It's essentially kind of liquid rubies and sapphires raining in these brown dwarfs. Oh, I could just imagine the John Lewis Christmas advert set on one of those. It'd be very beautiful. Yeah, it's it kind of kind of in my head. It's a bit like something out of Bejeweled Blitz or something like this. <laughs> oh my gosh, that would be a really good. Are there any astronomy-based computer games? That'd be really interesting. To um, something like that. There was one made by somebody in Texas that was. I can't remember. It's like an exoplanet based one where you kind of had to fire things into orbits, but I can't remember what it's called. Oh my gosh, so tell us, okay, so your new book is out now. Yes, so I tell can show the cover. Tell yeah. us. Oh, let me just enlarge my screen. Now, there are some beautiful astronomy books out at the minute. They're really going to town with the artwork at the minute. Let yeah, me this one, I just kind of said, give me something with 20 worlds on it that looks quite, you know, abstract, and they gave me this, which is fantastic. Let's just um, get you right, you're full screen now. So let's have it you. right up to the screen, please, Neil. There you go. Sorry, my lighting's terrible. Okay. Um, the extraordinary story of... Planets around other stars. Okay, so tell us a little bit more about the book, please, Neil. So it's uh, essentially te telling the story of planets around other stars using 20 known individual exoplanets as sort of jumping off points for chapters. So... It's not, you know, here are the 20 most awesome exoplanets possible. It's 
here are 20 exoplanets. Some of them are really exceptional planets, but trying to use each planet to tell a story about exoplanets in general. So how they might be found, uh, how they're characterized, how they are um, studied in different ways, how we know how they might form, how they might, you know, possibility of hosting life, how they might eventually die as well. Oh, wow. Okay, so tell us what, what do you love so much about exoplanets then? It's just, I, I, I like finding, in general, it's just, I like finding out new things with science. And how they characterize how they are. Um, sorry, we got a bit of feedback. Okay, sorry. Uh, yeah, um, and yeah, exoplanets, especially my particular kind of favorite things are free floating exoplanets and just ones where you can actually see them because quite often when uh, most of the exoplanets that we found have been found by methods such as the transit method where you're just spotting an exoplanet kind of getting in the way of its parent star and blocking the light um, or by the radial velocity method but there are a handful of exoplanets that have actually been observed directly and I just think that's really cool. I mean there's even some where they've been observed directly and over the course of the 10 years since they were discovered, the, uh, astronomers have managed to actually map the orbits, parts of the orbits mostly. So you can kind of see these arcs of actual planets moving in orbits around other stars. And I just think that's, that's really, really cool. That is pretty impressive. So what was your goal while you were writing this book then? Um, I just wanted to tell a story about as broad, as, uh, as broad a range of exoplanets as possible. And, not focus on one particular aspect because there are a couple other there's a couple other books in this uh, in this area that are studying things talking about things like how planets form or very earth-like planets and I, I cover those subjects but I'm somebody who sits in a lot of academic seminars about you know exoplanets things like that and it's I just wanted to get as much of this kind of cool stuff that I'd seen in various um, in various talks and so forth and kind of try and stuff it into a book that explained it in you know fairly simple terms yeah oh absolutely yeah so one of the um reviews of the book said that you've kind of written it in a very kind of down-to-earth fashion that's easy to understand for all audiences would you say yeah i mean i i kind of just thought i want to want to write it for someone who's the kind of intelligent non-specialist so i'm somebody who i like to read books on other subjects. I like to read books on things like history or economics and stuff like that. And there are quite a lot of authors who take things that are really complicated and they need PhDs to understand, but write it in a way that someone like me who's got no academic training in the subject can understand. And I kind of want to do the same to kind of make it something where not so it's something that's understandable, but also not just glossing over things where, you know, covering as much as possible in very understandable language, I would say. So there's a massive variety of exoplanets been discovered. Talk to me about the spectrum of them and what kind of things we've discovered in there. I mean, how long is it since we discovered the first planet, actually, the first exoplanet? The first exoplanet around, um, well, there was actually one that was sort of discovered and kind of retracted and then confirmed, but not counting that one. The first exoplanets would have been 1993, those were found around a, um, around a pulsar. The first ob uh, exoplanets around a sun-like star were 1995. I was unaware of the pulsar exoplanets. I bet they have a tough time trying to get mobile phone reception. <laughs> yeah, those are those are really really cool objects. Um, they are well, not not physically, but I mean awesome objects, not physically cool. Oh yeah. Um, and the the way that people think that they they came about is they were orbiting a, a pulsar, a dead star, a neutron star, and that would have formed by a supernova explosion. And you'd expect a supernova explosion would blast planets out of the way. So what the uh, theoretical astrophysicists think happened in this case was there might, any planets around this, this pulsar were blasted away by the supernova explosion, but there was another star orbiting this pulsar, and over time, that other star also died and became a white dwarf. And gradually those two start spiraling together as they orbited and when the white dwarf got really close to the neutron star the neutron star's strong gravity kind of stretched it and then shredded it into little tiny pieces 
and bits of that white dwarf that are coalescing together slightly further out from the neutron star and form these planets that now orbit this, this pulsar. And also some of the other material from the, the white dwarf smashed into the pulsar itself and started making it spin faster. So it's like this is this is why it's, it's what's called a millisecond pulsar, one of the fastest spinning pulsars we know about, one of the, fa the class of fast spinning pulsars we know about. Look at my frown lines. I'm just trying to get my head into that. I love the way astronomy, I mean, astronomers should be offered free Botox because we all have this like, like permanently like scrunched up face at the, the, the mind boggliness of it. Yeah. And the thing is, these, these planets should be mostly carbon. So it, it's possible that in the middle they're crystallized carbon, which would be diamond. You like the bling, don't you? Yeah, that's, yeah, <laughs> that's pretty amazing. Um, and it, I go through this in the, this is, they're one of the plants in the, in the chapter of the book. Um, and I go through the, the process of how this, this was, this idea was kind of guessed that being the most likely idea because you can kind of tell from a few clues about these pulsar planets and that they orbit a very fast spinning pulsar. They're quite rare. Um, a couple of other things that can rule out other ways that this uh, that these planets could have formed. So this is probably the best. This is the best model that we have for how these planets would have formed. It's been a while since an astronomy fact kind of bowled me over like that. I need to find out more about these. How do I find out more about that then? And um, so I, I will, I'll get the number is PRS twelve fifty seven plus twelve. Right, okay, I'll put that in my phone later and see if I can make a th connection through. <laughs> yeah, um, I, <laughs> I think the, the paper I'm referring to was from about 19, it was originally from 1996, but there are a few more papers developing on it a bit later on. But yeah, the, it's, it's such a weird set of planets to have. It's just so difficult to form them that you have, they had to come up with very, very weird models in order to form these things. That's one of my favorite new astronomy facts. So, I mean, I was going to ask you next, what blows your mind? And my mind is blown. So what blows your yeah, that, mind? That, that, well, that would be my answer. That's one of the things that blows my mind. I mean, it's just completely, Can yeah. you recap briefly, please, just so I can enjoy letting that sink into me again, please? Right. You had a, a, two stars in orbit. One of them exploded in the supernova and formed a neutron star in the middle. Now, that would have been a pulsar for a while, Eventually, it radiated away a lot of energy, slowed down, stopped giving out radio waves. The other star that was orbiting it died and became a white dwarf. And over time, these two things would spiral together. This was by the emission of what we call gravitational waves. And those caused gravi objects to slowly spiral together over time. In the book, I use the example of the Earth and the Sun, where they spiral together by something like four millimeters over the course of a few billion years but because these are more massive these are two more massive objects they would spiral together much quicker the white dwarf got to the point where it was so close to the neutron star that the tidal forces from the neutron star stretched the white dwarf into kind of oval shape and then eventually kind of broke it into smithereens that those kind of white dwarf smashed smithereen stuff was orbiting around the neutron star some of it smashed into the neutron star and made it spin faster. In the book, I use the example of, it's like having a student sitting on a, a revolving chair and lobbing textbooks at them and them catching them, it's kind of starting to spin around. Right. And that made the, point, the neutron star spin up and then some of the other material further out coalesced together and formed three planets that are still in orbit around this neutron star. And because the white dwarf would have mostly been a carbon oxygen white dwarf, most of the material, a lot of the material that formed these planets would be carbon and the core could be crystallized carbon. Wow, okay, that is amazing. Is there a special name for these exoplanets or? Pulsar planets. And there's only, a, there's only a couple, two or three, I think, uh, pulsar planet systems that have been found since then. But this was the first exoplanets found. I had no idea about that. Um, yeah, so, it was. I don't, I don't even care about hot. Beans. Actually, I think it was discovered at Arecibo. Oh, uh, it was a Polish astronomer working at Ar Arecibo that discovered it. I think pulsar planets is going to be the name for my new band. I love it. Right. Okay. 
Neil, thank you so much. Can you plug your book once more and tell us where we can um, purchase yes. it? It would make it's, a lovely Christmas present for you. Yes, these. absolutely. It's 20 Worlds, The Extraordinary Story of Planets Around Other Stars. Um, it's available from Reaction Books now. You can get it uh, in all bookshops, well, all bookshops online and a few other ones that might be open at this time probably aren't actually open. But yes, 20 Worlds, The Extraordinary Story of Planets Around Other Stars. So. Super duper. Now, as you've come on this evening, thank you very much. Um, uh, right, I don't know what your... Oh, the butterflies woke up. <gasps> Can I've I just say that this this game you're playing is kind of revenge on me because I used to run Astronomy on Tap Heidelberg and I played yeah. very similar bizarre games such as Rejected Constellation or London Pub or Exoplanet or Norwegian Heavy Metal Band. Oh. So I'm used to playing... to making people play kind of ridiculous astronomy games. I've woke the butterfly up with my heater. It's been hibernating for the past couple of weeks in here and it must have come to light. Well, it's got an enormous ring light on it. It's got a studio and a heater. So the butterfly must be thinking that it's summer. Mm. Come on, little fella. Come off my cable. Oh, it's, it's... Well, I've got to perform some butterfly rescue and I'll do you crater or potato. It can just sit down there. We've got a new astronomy pet. We've got a tortoiseshell butterfly. Okay, so is it crater or potato? It's a very simple game. Is it a crater or is it a potato? So the first one, it's a good name. It's Galois, spelt the French way. I would guess that's a potato. That's a potato. It is a 231 kilometer wide oh. crater. So it's quite a big boy. Where? Oh, excuse, I'm just having butterfly issues. Can you just bear with me? I should go and put it back, really, but I want the... It's just so beautiful, the blue. Oh, oh look, it's, can you see it? It's trying to get warm. Mm. I think mm. I'm going to just have to put it back to where it... Or maybe it could just live on my thumb for the whole programme. Okay, next question. Annabelle. What is that? Sorry, I didn't hear that. Annabelle. I'd say potato. Annabelle is a tuber. She has good resistance to splitting and good resistance to bruising. So well done. <laughs> and Hamilton, spud, oh, crater or potato or spud or thud? Because a crater is going to make a thud noise, isn't it? <laughs> spud I'd say that was a crater. That is a 57 kilometer wide crater on the surface of the moon. So well done to you, Neil. That is two out of three. So thank you so much for coming on this evening. Cool. Oh, it's got Bye, butterfly. The feeling. Bye, butterfly. Right, okay. It's really, really good to have you on. Um, I feel guilty for waking up the butterfly now. It definitely thinks it's midsummer's day in here with the light and heat on. But there we go. If it wants to be a show business butterfly, it's got to get down with it. Good luck with the book sales. Well done on your endeavours for writing the book. It's really quite something to write a book. I've tried multiple times. Fail. <laughs> Keep, keep trucking on and thank you so much and enjoy working in that sensational building the butterfly yeah. in around my head. See you later. Okay, <laughs> excellent, excellent. Now I'm getting really distracted by the butterfly now. It's it's crashing into the walls. Go away. What should I do? Is there a number we can call for butterfly rescue? Right, we've got Owen Gwynn from Midcheshire Astro coming on in a moment. Uh, first of all, I want to point these lovely things out to you. These are available from the SPA shop. Right now, you can tally your bathroom with them. Crab Nebula. Eye of God. These are like wibbly wobbly things that are, oh, that's nice actually. There you go, I'm at. That one is the Whirlpool Galaxy. That's what happens when you pull your bath plug out. Maybe we're all just going down the plug hole. The sun, that's really good, isn't it? Look at those nice prominences there, really, really good. This thing is cool as well. I've tried to assemble it. It's slightly beyond me. You have to be good at models to do this. This is Spatial Discovery, very tiny, thin model. And then check this one out. I bet the kids would love this because I remember being mesmerized with these things when I was a young girl, um, when I just used to have like a ruler with my little ponies on. So the kids are going to love that. Look at it. It's got all the arms of our galaxy on it. Right, we're going to go over to Owen, who has been sit, sat patiently waiting in the green room while I disturb butterflies. Are you ready to come on, Ian, in, uh, Owen, in three, two, one? Definitely, I'm ready. Oh, I miss you, Owen. It's been, it's been, it's been too long since we've seen you. Too long since it we've has. seen you. 
And also the Mid Cheshire. So Owen is from Mid Cheshire Astro, which meets in Delamere Forest in Cheshire, obviously. And do you tend to have your online meetings on a Friday night when I'm doing this? So I just don't see anyone anymore, do I? That's right. You've timed it so badly. No, unfortunately, we when we came back from lockdown or when we came virtually back from lockdown, we, um, yeah, we, we had to choose our continuous day and you had started. Well, I might be able to join your meeting soon because we're going to be having, uh, this is going to be the end of season in a couple of weeks. So I'm having a little break from Pop Astro Live to do a couple of other areas of my business. And um, it might mean that I'm free on Friday nights to come and pester you. Brilliant, brilliant. We we'll look That's forward to having you back with us. Ah, uh, so Mid Cheshire Astro, just to set the scene, I've been um, uh, lived in, in the shadow of Delamere Forest my whole life, pretty much. And um, we meet in a very rustic porter cabin, don't we? <laughs> Well, we have up till now. It's it's all changed. Unfor well, I say unfortunately, Forestry England put a lot of money and effort into building a new visitor centre. The old buildings have been decommissioned. So at the moment, apart from being virtually homeless, we are virtually homeless um, because we don't know where we'll be going back to. We have talked to the people in the new centre and we hope that we'll be able to use their cafe. There are things that we need to sort out. We need to sort out parking. But it's such a good site for us generally that it'd be ideal if we can go back there. Otherwise, we'll be wandering around looking for a, um, oh, a village hall or somewhere at local nearby where we can meet instead. But hopefully we'll be able to meet at the new centre. Just think in a couple of months, it might all be back to normal and we can go down into... So Delamere Forest is the remnants of... Um, it's not ancient forest anymore, but it's quite an old forest, a big pine forest um, plantation. And we meet in the little, or did meet in the little porter cabin. And just a couple of hundred meters away was a very deep dell that was shielded from the light pollution of Cheshire and Manchester uh, with pine trees on the horizon. And we'd all meet down there in the car park with our telescopes. Oh my God, it seemed like so long ago. It's been a while. It's been a while. Yeah. I mean, if it was clear after our club meetings, we'd, we'd, some of us anyway, the enthusiastic observers, the ones that weren't Im out imaging, that's right, we'd all go down with our telescopes and binoculars and we'd, we'd spend a good chilly hour and a half or so out there. What we didn't know, well, we were given a set of keys so we could let ourselves into the car park. That's one of the issues is, is how, we can, how we can manage the car parking in the future. Uh, we were frequently locked out or like, didn't you and your onions get locked in? That was the <laughs> That was the day when the guy with the keys didn't turn up. <laughs> yes, we had that problem. <laughs> did he have to stay overnight somewhere? He did. He did. But luckily, we're, we call ourselves a friendly society, so someone was able to put him up on a sofa. It was brilliant. It would be nice to have Julian Onion stay overnight. We could ply him with cake the whole night through. <laughs> <laughs> and never sleep because we'd all have so much sugar. Oh, I Owen, mean, it's so nice to see you. And um, one of the highlights is that the, the, there are cakes baked for us each month, aren't there? Liz, your missus bakes cakes. She does. I know it, it's um, it's nice because if I ate too many, all the cakes, I would be the wrong shape. So it's good that we can share them around. We'd be like Jupiter shape. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a real, for me, one of the real dilemmas is because, like, you used to bring like all these. Um, dead gooey cookies and all sorts of delicious biscuits and cakes and I would eat them and inevitably go home and not be able to sleep. <laughs> Friday nights once a month was the biggest sugar rush of the month really. It was really good. We we enjoyed we enjoyed catering and we enjoyed the company. I mean the company was was what made it special anyway. So what kind of stuff have you been doing in lockdown Owen for the um for the society? How have well, you pivoted? Because the word is pivot now isn't it? You've got to pivot. Oh, I don't know if we pivoted. <laughs> we had a couple of months off. We had a couple yeah. of months off. Um, and then we discovered actually Zoom worked quite well. So we took out a subscription and we've had Pete Williamson gave our inaugural Zoom lecture and that worked really well. Uh -huh. uh, and then we've had a couple of um, couple of uh, sort of club members giving talks. I've given one, Dave Beasley, our previous chairman gave one, uh, Janice Heyman gave one on binocular astronomy, and Julian came back and gave one a couple of months ago. And this Friday coming, a week tonight, we shall be talking, having a talk from Steve Barrett from Liverpool University. 
So uh, that'll be our treat for November. Oh, it's so nice that you're all still meeting. God, I'm forgetting all the names of people, to be honest. Yeah. So, um, yeah, tell us a little bit more about the demographic, because, like, you know, there's no doubt about it. I'm at the younger end of the demographic when we go, and I'm not really so much of a spring chicken. I'm more of a summer chicken. Uh, it would be great to have some younger faces in, wouldn't it, Owen? It would. It would. Uh, uh, the problem with, that we have, I think, with a lot of places is that you need transport and the young people don't necessarily have the transport. So we do have, it is fair to say that most of our uh, members are in the greyer end of the uh, um, audience. Gray, we're, we're, we have a grey spectrum, a main spectrum, that uh, a main sequence that ends up with grey. Um, oh, you do a heard sprung Russell diagram of astronomers. <laughs> <laughs> That would be a really funny comedy graph to do, wouldn't it? <laughs> it's a super giants that you worry about, but no. <laughs> it's a super giants you can plot a hair colour against age, against knowledge, against weight. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, we, we've got a, a fair, I suppose like many, we've got a fair number of retired people. We've got a few people approaching retirement and we've got a scattering of, of younger people, so... They're always welcome. And from time to time, people have brought their, their teenage and younger children along. And it, it's it's nice that we, we hopefully we feel they can fit in. It's just the hours and Friday nights and the transport to get out to us is, is where the problem lies. But I guess that's not uncommon. Would you say that you were a main sequence astronomer, um, Owen? I think I'm toward, heading towards that transition zone. So... <laughs> I'm definitely one of the ones that's like on like, the, the you're, big, definitely, you're, like, you're definitely you're definitely main out. sequence. You're main sequence. <laughs> but destined to be a super giant. Oh wow, yeah, that's so interesting. I like the idea of that. Oh, Owen, I'm missing Liz's little star cakes. Mm. <laughs> um, I know I don't get them too often either. So you've got an interesting um, Gallic connection out in France. Tell us about that. That's right. Yeah. Um, Beginning of last year, we saw that the Gita at Astro Farm has been, was being sold. And we knew Sue, and we'd, we'd been out to Astro Farm several times before. Just so explain we thought, Astro Farm, please. So Astro Farm is our, the founder, of, or one of the founders of Midchester Astronomy, who was a guy called Andrew Davis, who many of you will have heard of. Um, he taught astronomy at one of the local colleges, and he... Basically, it was a group of his um, students that decided that they would like to have a club. It was a Cheshire College, so it was based in Cheshire. And we ended up at, as Mid-Cheshire Astronomy. So after several years in, in the Cheshire area, he and his wife moved out to France and they set up a, an astronomy, dedicated astronomy centre on a farm a couple of miles outside of a small French town called Conflon, which is in Charente. Um, and they ran that for five years. Um, and five years ago, Andrew had to come back to Britain. Um, and we decided that we were in the position that we could buy the Jeet next door. They were uh, looking to uh, realise some capital, I think it was. So we, we bought the Jeet. Uh, it's still available for people to use if they want to um, for a price. Sue will arrange that. If you contact Astrofarm France, Sue will arrange your bookings. They're looking more for established astronomers who know their equipment, who take um, will take their equipment out. There is some equipment out there. There's mounts, and Sue will work a sort of um, couple of weeks every month when the moon is in the right position, i.e., not showing, uh, and Sue will uh, host you and we'll provide the astronomy site with excellent dark skies. We've had, we were out there in the summer and we had excellent dark skies so many nights. It was, it makes such a change to being here. You can't believe it. Aww. And the Milky Way stretching overhead is unbelievable. And it gets darker, they get more darkness, do they? Because they, they, they get darker earlier in the summer because they're further south and the skies are particularly clear. Sometimes you get a bit of haze early on, but it will, It'll drop out later in the night. So you definitely get much clearer skies than we have. Neil from Go Stargazing is watching. We have stayed in the Astro Farm Jit and thoroughly recommend it. Do you know Neil, um, Owen? 
I don't know. Well, I've been in touch, I think, with Neil through emailing about uh, details about the, the website. So, Hi, Neil. Cosmo the Telescope Sloth says hi. Right. Time, though. Never mind all that nonsense. It's time for Crater or Potato. Oh. <laughs> have you played this before it rings a bell with me that i've done this to you before but i haven't but i'll, I'll give it a go okay okay well i chose some fiendish ones for you anyway because i know you're a smarty pants uh. <laughs> okay crater or potato camelot camelot that sounds like a potato to me it's a very this I've just cut and pasted off the um, <laughs> database, the date, potato data. It's a very attractive party coloured variety with smooth skin and white tuber flesh colour. Camelot sounds like a sexy old spud. Okay. <laughs> It doesn't do chips. That is that's the main question. Oh, you know what we do now? We've made a new got a new way to make chips. We do a jacket potato uh, and then slice it up and then fry it. Oh yeah. <laughs> it's really good. That's okay. Good. Pioneer. That also sounds like a potato because it would be too it would be too modern to be a crater, I would say. Oh, you're too smart. Trials have found good resistance. This one's not as sexy. Trials <laughs> found good resistance to powdery scab, blackleg, common spat scab, and potato leaf roll virus. There we go. There you go. And now a final one to throw you. Oh, well. So that, I would say that has to be a crater. Wrong. You got oh. too early. Oh, well is an early main crop variety, Owen. So I uh, suggest you go home and revise your spuds, love. I should, and my craters as well. And your craters. Owen, it's been a pleasure. Maybe we'll meet again soon. Hopefully, hopefully. When we're That's allowed right. to, I mean, we're, we're not looking to meet um, in person at least for another five or six months, we expect. But if people go to the midcheshireastro.co.uk website, you can find details of our talks. If you drop me an email, I will invite you to, I'll send you an invitation to our Zoom meetings uh, last Friday every month. Not December, because that's Christmas Day. Uh, but la generally, last Friday of every month, people can join us. Uh, if you email, I will send you a link. This is for Liz. This is a kiss off Cosmo the Telescope sloth. Mwah. Oh, I want to Liz, says, <laughs> Liz wow. says thank you, and so do I. When was the last time a telescope sloth kissed you, love? Right, I'll speak to you later. See you soon, Owen. Yep. Hopefully Cheers. Soon. Thank you. Bye. Oh, slightly welling up there. Brilliant. Okay, that was Owen from Mid Cheshire Astro. Oh, where's Luke gone? My third guest has gone. He's disappeared out of my green room. room. Luke, come back. We're waiting for you. Let me just email him. Um, do me, me third guest is just the moose from the um, green room. So I better just find where he's gone. Maybe he's going to just try reconnecting. Um, let me send out. Oh, how do I do this now? Luke. Okay, Luke. Um, ready for you now, Luke. Forward. Luke. Ready for you now, Luke. Hopefully, he's going to pick that up. Let me just ping him a link on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Who doesn't love to see a TV presenter doing admin work? Uh, Luke, we're here now. Here now. Let's have a look. Oh, maybe his maybe his um maybe his internet's died. Okay, so let's take a look at the comments. Good to see you two again. Which two? Who? John Hammond? That name rings a bell. I loved it. I guess you're referring to Astro Farm. Dark Velvet Sky. Um, Pauline has been to Astro Farm as well. I've never been. It sounds so fantastic. The food and the beautiful little village where it is and the wonderful bridge that they have. Um, okay, so we've lost our third guest. I was going to show you this. Oh, he's come back. Robin has logged on as well. Robin, Luke has also popped on at the same time, so I think we're all right, Robin. Okay. Uh, okay, so here we go. Let's just get stuff ready for our third guest. Okay. So. Um, this thing here, I need to show you it because it pertains to Luke. 
This is amazing. This is my 3D printed telescope that I was gifted. It is a prototype of the four meter Liverpool telescope. Let's get Luke on, he might recognize this actually. Hey Luke, you all right there? Hi there, yeah, sorry. I'm, uh, I've am i just moved to my phone since I completely lost the uh, Wi-Fi at the exact moment I was supposed to appear. So. It's weird, sometimes this happens to my guests, they disappear at the precise moment they should be coming on. It's getting slightly more than coincidental nowadays, but can you recognize this? You uh, recognize I actually uh, don't know. <laughs> So I'll read out, read out to you what this is. This I've, is, ne I've never been to that. I've never been to that one. So it doesn't um, exist yet. It's still this is a prototype. All right. Okay. So this is the new robotic telescope. It's the Liverpool John Moores University project in collaboration with the Instituto do Astrofisica de Canarias, the National Astronomical Research Institute of Thailand and the University of Oviedo. Following the ongoing success of the two meter fully autonomous and robotic Liverpool telescope, the NRT will be a four meter facility co-located with the Liverpool telescope on La Palma, designed for rapid response, time domain astronomy, whatever that means. The project is currently in the design phase with an on-sky target of 2024. A combination of lightweight mirror technology and advanced material science will allow the NRT to slew to any part the sky and be observing a target within 30 seconds is that quick luke 30 seconds is very quick indeed yeah yeah it's uh, normally a three to 15 minute job depending on the telescope and if you're changing between instruments and things like that yeah so that's very fast so you drive these things don't you it is a bit like a steering wheel I you drive them. quite like that but uh <laughs> Is that not how you drive a telescope? Strange, strangely enough, no. <laughs> oh, you've just shattered all of my illusions. That's what I do. I watch the Formula One and, and sit there like that with it and pretend I'm Lewis Hamilton driving around the stars. So, Luke, tell us a little bit about your amazing job because yesterday you just dazzled me with what you do. Yeah, so I'm the uh, one of the many uh, lead astronomers for the Dark Energy Spectroscopic Instrument. So it's a, it's a new instrument, um, which does pretty much what the name suggests. So uh, it's doing a galaxy survey, a cosmological survey, uh, where we're getting the redshift of thousands and thousands of galaxies all at the same time. Um, kind of a follow on for some of the, the 90s and 2000s kind of uh, uh, big galaxy surveys like SDSS, the, the Sloan ones and 2DF, that kind of thing. Um, so I'm in charge of uh, sort of operating, controlling the instrument uh, of a night time. Um, and it's based in Arizona at the, the four meter wide um, mile telescope in, in Kitt Peak, um, which is uh, which is about an hour and a half, two hours away from Tucson um, on a, a Native American um, reserve on Native American land. So that's my job. Um, I was the last person there um in uh in, in the end of march and of course uh had to fly back asap um given the the situation and uh, we're just literally this weekend um restarting operations there at the telescope so fingers crossed i'll be back out there uh commuting to arizona in the near future commuting to arizona that is just sounds so nice the amazing skies out there yeah, it's brilliant. It's a it's about seven thousand five hundred feet. Um, very very low cloud cover. Um, if there is cloud, you're quite often above it. Um, not absolutely the darkest place in the universe um, because you are so high up. You can certainly see uh, glow from the from the from the native communities and from Tucson and, and from Phoenix and Scottsdale. Um, so it's not absolutely the darkest place on the entire planet, but the the, the seeing, so how much the stars twinkle, um, is 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 very low. It's a very stable atmosphere uh, and, and very very clear skies and very dry. So it's a great place. Yeah. So tell us more about the mission and what's actually happening and this elusive hunt that you're on. Right. So um, since. 1929-ish, uh, certainly since the 30s onwards, so sort of 90 to 100 years, um, we've gradually become more familiar with the idea that the universe is expanding, 
um, and the space between the galaxies is stretching. Uh, and that came from the sort of Hubble era work on the 100 inch Hooker telescope uh, in Palomar, um, measuring how far away galaxies were. Um, in those days, it was just using um, Cepheid variables as, as standard candles um, and, and nearby galaxies in, in small numbers, uh, but also doing spectroscopy, so splitting the light into its constituent colours um, and from those spectra uh, working out the redshift, so how, how quickly these galaxies were recessing away from us. Um, that eventually led to the idea of the Big Bang, uh, and then um, as that became sort of more accepted and then we, we found some sort of plot holes in the story of the Big Bang and we, we made some modifications with inflation theory and that kind of thing. Um, it, we gradually came to the idea that the universe would probably collapse back on itself. Um, all the gravity of all the stuff in it would eventually slow it down uh, and there would be sort of a big crunch. Um, and then sort of late 90s um, we found out the opposite. Um, looking at supernova brightnesses, type 1a supernovas as, as standard candles. Uh, we realized um, two different groups, um, including a guy called uh, Saul Perlmutter at Berkeley, um, they discovered the universe was getting faster and faster in, in its expansion, uh, and it was driven by this mysterious dark energy. Um, and we then sort of managed to constrain it and we, we know about two thirds of the, the energy density of the universe in fact is this mysterious dark energy. So now we're trying to do um, a sort of cosmological 3D galaxy map um, bigger and deeper and, and sort of sort of further away and in more detail than ever before and that will hopefully help us uh, constrain some of the properties of, of dark energy. So when we say it's a dark energy project we're not you know, we're not collecting particles of dark energy in some special telescope. Uh, we're not producing it in some sort of particle collider or anything like that. Uh, it's, it's a visual optical telescope um, making measurements, but, but from those, those measurements, we'll be able to kind of infer more and more about dark energy uh, and its, its history uh, throughout the, the, the universe and, and how it's becoming more and more dominant and, and, and how and why it might have switched on. Best guesses as to what it might actually be. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I have absolutely no idea. Um, I'm, I'm not actually a cosmologist, so um, uh, I'm actually an instrument scientist. So my job is building the instruments that go on some of these big telescopes. Um, and uh, and because this this particular instrument is incredibly complex, um, it has well over a million parts, uh, <laughs> forty three cameras, um, uh, ten spectrographs with thirty channels. Uh, we have five thousand robots at the top of the telescope, which reposition fiber optics. Um, they actually took on a team of people who'd been involved in in building the thing, but who also had observational uh, experience on big telescopes to 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 drive it um, because if something goes wrong uh, on something that costs 100 million dollars and took 10 15 years to build it's uh, it's a bad time so can i google a picture of this thing uh you can it probably just looks like a, a black cylinder on top of the telescope because it's, it's oh. all hidden away um if you can get a a google video of the uh, the fiber position as moving uh, that that might be quite interesting but, and what's it called again sorry it's called desi the dark energy spectroscopic instrument desi dark matter not desi dabber whoever he is i think he's a musician he sounds like a dj <laughs> <laughs> desi dabber dj when desi dabber <laughs> Oh, do you know how much I was only thinking before? I used to be a bit of a club girl and I'm really missing dancing on a podium. <laughs> <laughs> the Dark Energy Spectroscopic Instrument. It's a scientific research. Uh, oh, I see. Okay, so it is like a, it is a cylinder. It is a cylinder. Yeah, there's actually a, a whole other room with uh, a clean room with, with 30 cryogenic cameras and all kinds of optics and things in. Um, but uh, the, the, the bit that you're seeing there that sits on top of the telescope um, is actually full of, of robots. There's 5,000 robots in there. Like so, little metal Mickeys or just little? They're, they're kind of the same sort of shape and size as a, as a big ballpoint pen. And they have right. a little, um, I'll hold my arm out. They have a little kind of double joint, like an elbow like that. So um, they, can, they can kind of position a fiber anywhere within their little sort of honeycomb. 
uh, oh, okay. on top of wherever uh, at the galaxy they happen to be looking at is. Well, our president, Stephen Sargent, hello Stephen, hope to get you on soon, says dark energy is one of the biggest mysteries in physics at the moment. I know. I know as well. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know Stephen, by the way? He's our president. I don't. I recognise the name, but I don't, I don't know him personally, no. That is pretty cool. So what kind of stuff does your day job entail then? I'll keep holding this up. So your your instrument, I mean, this it doesn't look like this, but it's, it's your thing is going to sit somewhere around there, is it? That, exactly right. Yes, exactly right. And then there's fibre optic cables kind of in, uh, in giant hose pipe things that go down the side. Um, so... So my day-to-day -day job at Durham is is working on instrumentation. So I um, I used to work on a, a very high-resolution spectrograph, um, uh, which was used for exoplanets. So it ties into the the earlier talk uh, that we had tonight, um, which was really interesting actually, because I've got the the pulsar exoplanet sort of NASA retro vintage travel poster on my office wall and i didn't know myself the story of how it was created so oh, really i've got a couple of those ones i've got um enceladus the uh, life under the ice i've got the mars one i've got q a couple of them so what's the um there's a pulsar planet one as well the P mars yeah there is yeah they've done an exoplanet travel series and it's um you know pegasi 51b is your first exoplanet and there's there's ones where they've got kind of a, a binary star system and and um People have two shadows on the posters and things. Yes, that's the one I've got. Kepler, where your planet, where your shadow also always has. Company. That's the one. That's the one. Yeah. And there's a, there's got... a super Earth with high gravity where people parachute as well. <laughs> and I think my favourite one is the Grand Tour, and it's like got Saturn and all the racing spacecraft going along. Oh, They're no, fantastic. They are fantastic. Yeah. So uh, yeah. they are. They are so good. So tell us then the mapping of the galaxies has been drastically the speed that they are mapped per night is drastically increased on this instrument yeah it's uh it's a roughly i mean it depends exactly how the galaxies are distributed um in the field of view of the telescope uh and uh, and that kind of thing um but it's a it's approximately five thousand galaxy spectra that we get at the same time so that's that's really one of the big advantages of desi it's uh, it's extremely efficient so we can get this this very faint light from very far away uh, galaxies and quasars even um and it's also extremely sort of operationally efficient so we can uh, move these fibers in a matter of minutes and reposition them for the next field uh, as the telescope's sort of slewing round um as a as opposed to sp spending hours physically putting fibers in little plug sockets in the right place and custom made metal plates for every single field that you, oh, yes, you, you said it to take, take eight hours to do uh to position for the sake of a 20 minute exposure yeah hours yeah so you, you would you'd have a big metal disc with holes put in the right place and someone would manually plug plug them all in um and uh, so being able to reposition uh the 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 focal plane of the telescope um in a matter of minutes uh is is very is very important uh having the efficiency um so that we don't have to expose for so long uh, and then also just being uh, being able to do five thousand at the same time instead of a few hundred so over the over the period of five years we'll measure about 35 to 40 million uh galaxy positions so we'll, we'll get the largest ever 3d map of our place in the universe I'm sorry, sorry to be just, I've got, I'm in a, I'm in a disused laundrette at the minute and the insect is waking up, I've got an ant on me and I've woken up a butterfly, which is now really distracting because it's trapped in the light shade and I feel really bad now. So I'm just going to have to, <laughs> I've got an ant on me in the middle of winter. Sorry, little thing, be free. <sighs> so, so what kind of stuff are you hoping to discover then with this amazing research that you're doing? So it's it's funded by the U.S. Department of Energy, and its 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 entire sort of mission is is what they call a a, a stage five or a phase five uh, dark energy project. So the the whole name of the game is to get a kind of enough enough data in terms of the quantity and high enough quality data of of positions and and recession velocities and things um, that we can constrain some of the properties of of dark energy. So we won't at the end of this suddenly find out um, absolutely everything there is to know about dark energy. Um, it, it's just sort of hemming in um, some of the theories or being able to reject some of the theories of what might be causing this um, this, this phenomena. 
Um, so that's the, the, almost the entirety of the mission. Um, but of course, we'll be operating. Um, you know, it's it's a it's a late sixties, early seventies telescope that's four meters wide, uh, and it's been repurposed specifically for this one instrument. Um, wow! So they actually completely overhauled the telescope, but they also completely overhauled um, the the secondary uh, optics on the telescope. So the it has until large sun optic survey takes over. Um, or the, the Vera Rubin telescope, as it's called now, uh, the largest lenses ever made. They're, they're well over a meter wide. They're pushing 300 kilograms each. Um, and it gives the telescope an enormous field of view. So we can see a huge patch of the sky at the same time. So it's, it's given a new lease of life to this to this um, workhorse t telescope from sort of the, the previous generation of, of the huge telescopes. Uh, but it means that it's it's purely dedicated to this one instrument. So we'll literally just do this measurement again and again and again, all night, every night. Um, but of course, we'll we'll also pick up a lot of quasars. Um, there's there's a quasar working group there. Um, there will be times where we're very close to sort of the galactic plane, and we've got a lot of uh, Milky Way in the way. Oh. Um, and um, there'll be times that we're observing when it's full moon. Or uh, uh, or there's 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 clouds over, and we have to to move the telescope closer than we'd like to the moon uh, position. So we'll also pick up a lot of bright stars. So there's there'll be a huge bright star catalog um, that we can tie into Gaia uh, as well. So uh, there will be a lot of peripheral science that comes from just having a huge number, you know, tens tens of millions of spectra of objects um, available to us. Whoa! You can drop that microphone, Luke. Yeah. That's well, I can't because it'll be my phone. <laughs> yeah, and I can't drop mine because it will go through the floor. <laughs> Luke, thank you so much. Neil Sanders no of problem. Neil Sanders of Ghost Stargazing is goading me on to play Crater or Potato with you. Are you ready? I'm, I'm not sure I am ready. No, T two out of three for both the last guests. It's, it can only go downhill from here. Okay, so the first one. It's a <laughs> Joe Mo. Not FOMO, but JOMO. JOMO. Ooh. Um, I'm going to say potato. It's it's actually a crater, and it's an African male name. It's eight kilometers wide, so you can be forgiven for not knowing about that one because okay. it's similar. Okay. okay, a great name now. Lionheart. Crater or potato? Potato. Well done. It's a main crop variety, particularly suitable for French fries. Get McDonald's on the phone. Oh, wow. <laughs> and finally, quite a regal sounding name, Wilson. Wilson. Uh, it, could be, it could be a crater caused by a massive volleyball impact. Oh, oh I like um, it. Ooh, Wilson. I'm going to say crater. Well done. It's 67 kilometers wide. Um, oh, just before one. we go, actually, congratulations. I think you got two out of three. I wasn't really keeping score. I was trying <laughs> to figure out some cool questions to ask you. Because the spin off, uh, just one final thing before we go there is spin off tech coming from this amazing experiment. So tell us about that. Um, yeah, so we, we, we're kind of the first to, to use um, these kinds of smart focal plane things. Um, uh, there's, there's repositioning fibers in this kind of uh, grandiosity and, and, and sheer number. So there are other rival projects. There's PFS, which is going on Subaru. Um, so they'll have the advantage of a, of a larger telescope. So they'll get they'll get more light in. So they they'll maybe go a bit deeper, or or maybe they can afford to go a little bit high resolution. Um, uh, and also um, a, a rival called Foremost, which is going in the southern hemisphere. So so Desi, of course. Uh, is a northern hemisphere thing, um, but um, but uh, there is a, a sort of similar-ish instrument called Foremost, which which I also work on at Durham, um, um, which is going on the Vista telescope, so another four meter telescope uh, in Chile. That one doesn't need to be overhauled to have a huge field of view because it's already um, incredibly fast telescope. So so there are other ones like that coming along. Um, there are other plans of what we will do after Desi's finished. So we might um, extend by a couple of years, um, maybe to get more completion for the, for the sky coverage um, or, or some missing data, higher, deeper data. Um, there's talk of a sort of 
uber desi with 20,000 fibers mm -hmm. so we might we might take it on the next stage in terms of the quantity of observations again um there's there has been spin-offs even actually for for the company called um molex that make plug sockets on your on your wall uh they also make optical fibers um and uh the, the, the properties of the fibers that we look for in astronomy are, are quite different to what they use in, say, telecoms um, for your broadband. Um, and so they now they now test their fibers for um, things like focal ratio degradation performance and all this kind of thing that's that's kind of come from from the astronomy world rather than the, the telecoms world. So um, there's the sort of industrial um, benefit there as well. That's so exciting. Thank you so much, Luke. Um, no problem. Just some of my favourite topic areas there. Thank you so much. Um, and I hope your life returns back to normal fairly soon. And good yeah. luck to all with Desi. And it's been an absolute pleasure having you on. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah. That was a good old mind boggling, spoon bending episode of Pop Astro Live, wasn't it? Thank you to everybody who's contributed in the chat room. Do consider becoming a member of the SPA, volunteer to edit our magazine. Great step up in the cosmological publishing world. Uh, Pop Astro Shop, it's got all this good stuff going on. Beautiful Anna Lemon Nicholas. Thank you to Neil Deacon and also to Owen Glynn with an E <laughs> from uh, Mid Cheshire Astro. And um, once again, I really don't want to go. I'm having a bit of a crisis here. Oh, thank you, Paulina. Thank you. Fantastic talk. Yeah, really well explained. Absolutely really well explained. Um, does anybody know the phone number for Butterfly Rescue? Something terrible has happened. I'm going to see. This might work. Oh, okay. This is, this is just really, for a nature lover like me, it's stuck in the light. What am I going to do? This is just the worst thing ever. I've woke it up with my heater and it's very active and it currently thinks it's on holiday, probably in Arizona, actually. <laughs> what am I going to do? Suck it out with a hoover. There are hoovers in here. I'll never get it in there. Put a pair of tights over the end of the hoover, suck it out. Um, this is really quite distressing, actually. I feel awful. And I woke up an ant as well. Ants in the middle of November. Got ants in my pants. Okay, popular astronomers. See you next week. We've got a couple more of these shows left before I take a break. Um, and uh, we're going to have a season finale. And if anybody has got a direct hotline to, to Jodrell Bank, the Square Kilometre Array, and all the other amazing tele, uh, radio telescopes out there, how can we campaign for them to all bow their heads? Maybe all the telescopes in the world could actually just go and fall silent and still in a moment of remembrance for the mighty Arecibo, which has fallen. We feel solidarity with you, Arecibo. What's Dave? Diffuser will detach from the fitting, otherwise it's a gonna. I don't think I'm going to be able to get a diffuser off. How do you do that? I'm going to empty a load of wasps all over me if I do that. Dead wasps from the autumn. <laughs> right. Beautiful astronomers. Put the light out and it will either go back to sleep or find its way out. Okay, I better go. Catch you later, popular astronomers. Bye. Great show, Vic. Oh, hang on, wait a minute. That just popped in. Thank you. Stephen, you need to come on and be a guest. I've sent you so many emails. Please come on and be my friend because we all want to meet our president. Um, thanks, Vicky, for tonight's show. Thank you. It was good, Neil. Thank you so much. Good luck with Ghost Stargazing. Catch you all later. The end cap will pull back, but don't drop it. It's high. I would have to stand on a chair. The butterfly is going to just have to fend for itself. I'm so sorry. You will have a butterfly update next week. They're getting rare. It's a large tortoise shell, I think. It didn't seem to be a small one. I know they're rare. Bye, Paulina. Soon, my pretty. Soon, Stephen will be on. Please come and play, Stephen. The comments are all coming on. Hi, Vicky. Try and get Tim O'Brien sometime. Tim, answer my emails, please. That'd be lovely. Sweet dreams, Vicky, of dying butterflies. <laughs> right, see you later.